I will request Rotarian Pramin Nizhara to introduce the guest speaker, Vijay Singh Ji. Mr. Brijesh Singh is an IPS officer with a distinguished career in cybersecurity and law enforcement. Currently, he serves as the Principal Secretary to the Chief Minister of Maharashtra. Previously, he was the Additional Director General of Police in Maharashtra, overseeing Maharashtra Cyber, the state's cyber security unit. Mr. Singh led key initiatives, including the Maharashtra Cyber Project, CERT, and Predictive Policing Units. He modernized the Information and Public Relations Directorate with projects such as the Media and Social Media Analysis Center and Cutting Edge Recording Studio. He also implemented the automated multimodal biometric identification system in Maharashtra using iris, face recognition, and fingerprint identification for crime detection. Under his leadership, the Maharashtra Cyber Digital Crime Unit successfully dismantled over 400 pirated websites. As an author and tech thought leader, Mr. Singh has written the thriller Quantum Siege and the well-received Dangerous Minds of India. He has received numerous awards, including the DG's Insignia Maharashtra 2016 and the National Police Academy's DG's Insignia for his contributions to IPS officer training. Mr. Singh is a recognized expert on cybersecurity, regularly appearing on Parliament TV and other national channels, and contributes opinion columns to major newspapers. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together to welcome Mr. Vijay Singh to Rotary Bombay Bayview. It's amazing, a room full of professionals and you're so happy and energetic at this time. <laughs> I came from office and by this time everybody was so sleepy in my office <laughs> after four cups of coffee. Okay, so let's not uh, do a formal talk. Um, let you, uh, you ask me anything on governance, on cybersecurity, on policing. So, uh, okay, let me bait you with something which affects everybody. I used to handle traffic for the city 10 years back. So 2010 to 14, I was handling traffic uh, for the city. Uh, after that, I've been handling cybersecurity. And after that, then I've been working with the state government. Okay, questions, shoot. Anything? I have a question. Yeah. At the age you hand them over mobile phones. <laughs> so there was a small video of a, of a small girl that, uh, see, digital natives, and, and, and uh, we are not digital natives, right? Those, those kids are digital natives. So there was a video of a small girl. She's reading a magazine, and she's trying to expand the picture there. <laughs> so their whole experience of the world is that the world is a place which is digital. For us, it is not digital. And uh, the way, uh, you know, Pramod Mahajan had said at one time that uh, computer literacy, if anybody doesn't know computers, he's not literate. I think today, if you do not know basics of cybersecurity, uh, you're not secure. So your mobile phone is much more powerful than your laptop. It has probably more memory than your laptop. It has more apps and more functionality. It knows much more about you. It knows all places you visit. It has your location. It has your identity, it has everything, right? And we don't secure it. The mobile is hardly secure. Uh, you don't use any, any firewalls, any um, antivirus or anything on the mobile phone. Now, and mobile phones we are handing to children. Children have very different concepts of privacy. They think that, uh, and, and sharing. So, and children experiment, right? They, they share intimate pictures, uh, they are taking, I'm speaking openly here. It's, it's, a, it's a mature audience. So without understanding that if that bacha is taking a picture and sending, it's not going from phone to phone. It's jumping all over servers in the world, you know, putting, I don't know, some hundred copies somewhere. And it's going to retain. The internet is like a tattoo. It cannot be taken off. And people do not realize that. I've dealt with cases where children have been blackmailed, and uh, then they've been led into this rabbit hole of you know, sharing more and more pictures and into sextortion, um, even at times leading to very you know, sad incidents. So somewhere I feel what has happened here is that 
the child knows more than us. They know how to, you know, uh, delete browser history, or I see parents who are using parental control apps. Ziki, and then, you know, you are sitting at a dinner and they get a call from the bacha saying, Ki, I want three hours more of Instagram. You are doing that, but you don't know that that kid has already surpassed that. That kid has four more accounts which you are not aware of. That kid has, you don't even know. Earlier, at least with apps, uh, which were out there in the open, like Facebook, you could at least see the friend group or, you know, friend list. But today, things like Instagram and all, they promote dangerous behavior. That you have, what kind of stupidity is this? Every time you snap and then you talk. I mean, it's some kind of a mental disease. Sorry, I'm a bit old, so I can say this. So, but uh, what it has led is to uh, a wiring of the mind in such a way, there must be uh, doctors and physicians here, it, you know, uh, hacks your mind into these dopamine cycles. Is that, that bacha or anybody who's continuously on this is looking at flickering light and, look, and, and the mind is processing something. So it's, it's on a perpetual high, like a drug. And as soon as you keep this, the child or the person feels low, right? And then it's depressed, doesn't want to eat, doesn't want to talk. And you go to their room and they don't want to talk to you. Because the mind has already, you know, run in the first gear for 50 kilometers. It's not meant for that. See, the Chinese are smart. If you take TikTok from a Chinese number, it tells you, um, how to build your health, how to be a good citizen, yeah? And if you have TikTok from American number and all, it is all these, you know, idiots doing reels, <laughs> wasting everybody's time. So, uh, these companies have made an economy, you know, out of attention. You would not imagine the kind of information that is passed on from your mobile phones. I'll ask you to do a simple experiment. So there is this site called, it's a safe site, it's called deviceinfo.me. You can right now just check on deviceinfo.me and you see the number of parameters your phone is sending right now. So the f if you go on deviceinfo.me, it will tell you information about you. It will tell you make, model of your device, operating system. It would tell you your location. It also knows whether the phone is in your hands or on the table because it is having an access to the accelerometer. This information is going out without anything. So companies then, they build, uh, you know, they monetize this information. They have, they have profiled everybody. So, so the company sitting out there, it knows what is your paying capacity, what time you get up, what time you eat, what time you sleep. Yeah, simple experiments can be done. So I used to handle cyber and we used to, you know, at times we had to, uh, look into certain accounts and um, you know what you had to do you had to take a dump of its tweets of year along and just look at its timings and you would get clear histograms as to when this chap wakes up what is his period of activity when does he sleep yeah all these things you can then calculate time zone from there okay this looks like pakistan one and a half hours yeah simple things and now, uh, at least these platforms have started scrubbing something called metadata. But all your photos contain so much information about you, including your locational information. And then the most dangerous thing that is coming up is facial recognition. And while we are so bothered about, you know, thinking that government will take away our data, the kind of data that is going to, uh, to these large corporations which are actually monetizing your data. So they know what mood you are in. They know whether you are hungry. They know whether you are entering here, so what kind of ad should be pushed to you. Yeah? So when you interact with them, let's say you call the Google team and say that, okay, I want to do an ad campaign. What can you do for me? They would give you such great details about everybody. So a friend of mine used to run this company which sat inside gaming platforms. So world's largest gaming platforms, um, the company sat as a service inside that. So let's say if you had a problem uh, in the 12th level of a game, one door is not opening, so you could, you know, uh, uh, you could talk to the chatbot and before these chatbot days, they could tell that, okay, you know, we have taken care of your bug and there's a ticket number. But the kind of information that he had, he had 
some 500 parameters on each of these people. Yeah, and they could predict how much will they spend. So they have created spending models based on this. Um, so Google actually also has a particular ad ID which is associated with your mobile phone. Your mobile phone may be a Google phone, mobile phone may be an Apple phone, but it has an ad ID. And that ad ID remains constant, whether you change your SIM card or whatever, whatever. And that ad ID, uh, if Google wants, it can know anything about you. So Google had algorithms which could you know, predict 100 days of your life. They still have. The next 100 days of your life, they can predict what exactly you're going to do. So that is the level at which technology has evolved. And uh, let me on record say something very strange. OK, what is the origin of Google? Who created Google? Google was created by a company called InQtel. InQtel is a venture capital firm. You know whom, whom does InQtel belong to openly? It belongs to the CIA. Right? And I'm saying this officially on record, knowing that I'm being recorded. <laughs> yeah? Please check InQtel, I-N-Q-T-E-L, and check up whether it made Google or not. So there's a company which CIA created, which has all the data of the world. Wow. Yeah? And you don't know, even the dark web, there's something called Tor. You hear about dark web, dark web markets, is that the Tor was created by the US Navy. So. One country would be having so much of information, even in the dark web, they would be having, I definitely assume that they would be having some kind of a backdoor there where they can dip in and find out information. Now, anybody who will contain, uh, you know, you know uh, have, have access to this information will control the world. I think Mr. Ambani said that data is the new oil. And I had written an article which, which was entitled, Data is Inflammable Oil, because Data can be used anyways. You saw the uh, US elections, that one company in the USSR, one company by a chap called Prigozhin, they created, there was this company called Internet Research Agency, IRA. These guys created pages on Facebook and run the Trump campaign. Yeah, it's, it's all recorded history as to whether they affected or not, or it's history. Uh, and it said that a large portion of Trump's victory was because of all these campaigns which were created by the Russians. You imagine that when Trump was contesting, we initially used to feel, no, this is a joke, right? <laughs> this can't be serious. Probably this man will never win. But you saw how public opinion changes. And public opinion can be changed. Uh, so Facebook did, in Venezuela, Facebook did this experiment. It was called Contagion. It's a paper. I think uh, you can check for this paper. It's probably by Columbia University or something. It's a paper on social science. What they did was that there are automated algorithms which decide what will come on your feed. It's not natural. There are algorithms. So for one whole country, these guys decided one month to give them sad feeds, right? Sad, sad uh, images, uh, sad news, this thing. And they found that on various indicators, the mood of the whole country was depressed. And then they had to drop this experiment. It's a scientific paper in a university. So even without your knowledge, somebody sitting somewhere can tweak an algorithm and change your behavior. So that probably answers whether we should, when should we, you know, teach cybersecurity. Yeah. So how, how do you stay ahead? Sorry. No, I'm just. So then how do you stay ahead of uh, all these things? I mean, this is going to keep advancing, and um, technology is going to keep moving ahead. How do you, as a layman or you know somebody who wants to protect his family, his business, how do you stay ahead of uh, cyber security? Two things. One is common sense. So, <laughs> no. So, so don't do something which you don't do in real life. Don't do you know online, right? So we, we don't go randomly meeting people, befriending them, telling them what food you have eaten, or your pet's name, or all your security questions to the passwords. Yeah? What are the secu security questions to your passwords? You know, what's your mother's maiden name? What was the name of your first pet? All this available. Yeah. So from there, you can somebody can easily go on to password recovery and start answering these questions and 
take over your account. Once your account is taken over, so what happens if your email is taken over? You know, you would have given your passport to somebody someday, you would have given your photos to somebody somewhere, your bank account, your links of your bank account, and everything, everything, your whole identity can be taken down. No, I had, we had seen a case wherein uh, somebody got access to another person's email, he took you know, photocopies of the passport, came to India, made an account in the name of that company with original documents from the email, transferred money. You know, some hundred million dollars or something. Yeah, never been found. <laughs> guys just, yeah, guys just went off. So, it's amazing. Um, this, uh, the other thing other than common sense is cyber hygiene. Hygiene is basic things, you know. Don't download apps from untrusted sources. Just check your phone. There'll be probably 20 apps which you have not used in the last 10 months. Just delete them. And we have unnecessarily, we give permission to apps. And we all have good data packs. I don't know why we want to log into Wi-Fi. <laughs> Everywhere, you know, you can just set up a Wi-Fi point. So uh, this experiment can be done. I was once doing a course in police academy. So I took a small dongle at the time, five, 10 years back. And I said, free Wi-Fi. And I was ran running a packet capture on that. So everybody, whatever they were browsing, <laughs> was open on my console. And I was like, <laughs> nicely seeing that. <laughs> Then, at the <laughs> just to scare them, then during the lunchtime, I say, you're browsing this? <laughs> so, just to tell that it's so easy, because it's not that, you know, if, let's say this is the router, it's not a communication be happening between your phone and the router. It's, it's your spring packets all over. And I can do a man-in-the-middle attack, I can emulate this, I can sit there with any device and just capture all this. It's very easy. It's not difficult. So cyber hygiene, basically um, not to log on to you know, stray Wi-Fi's. Also, don't do any transactions on Wi-Fi, at least outside. Do transactions on your own phone ka, you know, data. Um, don't download anything, don't generally click links from anybody you don't know, because clicking a link can compromise your phone. If your phone starts showing some strange behavior, then probably if it's heating too much, if it's not a battery problem, then it's probably sending too much data outside. So if it's sending too much data outside, it means that it may be compromised. And generally, uh, hacking of phones is not as common as it's believed to be, because technically phones are difficult to hack. What is easier to do is something called social engineering. You get these calls. Ki, Aray, Ramesh ji bol rahe hai. Aapka date of birth ye hai. Right? Aapka, you know, account number ye hai. This comes from data breaches. In a data breach, this chap gets this information. He establishes trust. He tells you this kind of thing. Then he uses the classic thing, like either fear, ki aapki bijli kat jayegi, aapka uh, life insurance band ho jayega, yeah? or uh, your credit card is going to be blocked. Or he uses some authority figure, this thing, that I'm talking from here, I'm talking from customs, I'm talking from the police, I'm talking from here. Nowadays, these buggers have you know, done on true caller, they've tried, uh, you know, they uh, masquerade as ACP cybercrime on true caller. <laughs> Smart chaps. <laughs> Today I was sitting in a meeting and this guy calls up and starts talking to me. I said, Are bhaiya, mujhe chhod de ya. <laughs> Don't do it to me. <laughs> I'll find out wherever you are in the world, you know. <laughs> then he starts fighting with me. <laughs> I just asked him, bhai, tumhare manager ko phone dena. Kyon bol diya aapne manager ko phone dena? <laughs> so, uh, cyber hygiene and common sense. And don't overshare. Also, if you're using any apps or thing, uh, limit your privacy. And there are very simple YouTube videos. You can go and find out. For example, you don't want anybody to download your profile picture. You can lock your profile picture. Theek hai. Somebody may screenshot and do something like that, but that's a different thing. But generally, you don't want people to be downloading your photos and morphing them. So it becomes difficult. So create difficulties for the attacker, because he's going to go for the lowest hanging fruit. So, so deepfakes have become so common. Yeah. Yes, they have become common. And, but that's also a defense. Asli wala niklega to bol dena deepfake hai. So uh, the technology has become so close 
See, there is the technology behind deep fakes is something called GAN, you know, generational adversarial networks that it, it you know, challenges that with an input to be near to the original. And then it creates something which is very near to original. It can be done. However, uh, if you have good compute, then you can find out that there are slight discrepancies. Like sometimes when you're speaking, your eyes move with that in a particular way. Or that there is, you know, a set of uh, emotions, expressions, and micro expressions which go along with the content of your talk. So that does not happen so accurately in deep fakes. It can be done, but it's difficult. But see, deep fakes uh, were thought to be problematic, uh, but ironically, or probably if not ironically, I think 90% of deep fakes are being used in porn. Otherwise, deep fakes uh, is like morphing. Earlier, also Photoshop, you could actually take somebody's picture and you know put the head there and put the body there. So that way, deep fakes, I think. Uh, are not a big concern. However, I'll tell you of one case, uh, which you can Google about. On a live Zoom call, on a live Zoom call, they impersonated the CEO on a deep fake and did a $10 million scam yeah, with voice cloning and all. So there's a company called Eleven Labs. You can just now clone anybody's voice, and then whatever you type will be spoken in that person's voice. Eleven Labs. Many such apps are available, but see, technology is, is going to uh, be there. It's, it's, uh, it's not going to stop. And the uh, thing is that how we understand, let's say if, if I'm handling police or I'm in crime, uh, there's a lot of contextual information. So if somebody is using a deep fake, then somebody within five minutes is going to say this didn't happen. So there's a way to verify that. So there's a lot of contextual information. Where did this happen? Oh, Mr. Singh spoke this in a rotary function. So I'll be, okay, who's there in rotary? I can cross-check that. Is there an original footage available? So there are ways to verify that. So first impact can be there. It can be reputational, it can be, yeah, please. Sir, could you throw some light on AI? Yeah, which AI? They will see AI has been around for a long time. Could we, could we use it in the right way? No, generative AI is different. Generative AI has totally changed the discussion around uh, AI. But AI has been there for long. AI, uh, the earlier AI is something like an advanced statistics, that it can take a large data set and draw inferences out of that, right? For example, your credit score, or, um, or let's say optical character recognition, or facial recognition, or automatic number plate recognition, this is all AI. But this generative AI uh, is a different thing because it emulates a human. Okay, uh, I'll tell you how generative AI happens. So, let me give you four words. Give me, give me four words. Let's say uh, egg, um, banana, uh, bread, and pen. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, if I give you four words, egg, banana, bread, and pen. Right? Pen is different. Your mind is forming pictures. So, words have conceptual distances between each other. So, like... All the others are foods of different variety and they are bunching together. Pen is different. Similarly, if you take all the information of the world and then create a map out of it, then this is called a semantic space. And words are, have directions and distances. So a word like glass, it may have a context. So all the context around glass, whether it is glass or glass or volcanic glass or any kind of glass, or ophthalmologists may talk about glass. Yeah, So different kind of glass, all these bunches would be together in terms of a map. And that is what has been converted into something called a large language model. And you'll be surprised that with a you know, 10 GB file, 20 GB file, it has all the information in it. The information is in terms of this word map of distances. That every word, how it is related to other words. That's it. And what AI does is that how sentences are created. Generative AI, it is just a smart autocomplete. Right? I say, I am a, it will start writing the next, in the context. That is, that is what is generative AI, nothing else. So it is like a parrot. It's a smart autocomplete. That is why it emulates humans. It has no information otherwise. In one uh, court case in the US, 
Vakil Sahib presented, there's a lawyer here, Vakil Sahib presented something in the court and after halfway through the court says, what is the reference? AI had actually imagined these cases. And I'll tell you a bad one. So I was called at the IS Academy recently, four days back, to talk about, you know, uh, India's criminal jurisprudence totally changed on the 1st of yeah. July. Yeah. yeah? So like every other smart person, I thought that this ko jaldi pad lete hain. You know, three, teen laws kaun padega? So I actually put the PDFs uh, inside, uh, I have other GPTs with me, I have Claude, this, that. I put the GPT inside that and prepared. And uh, before the lecture, one day, one night before, I thought that I was very prepared. I had 40 pages of notes on electronic evidence in you know all the three acts and so on and so forth. Then I checked that this bugger had absolutely hallucinated. Those sections didn't exist. <laughs> Thank God I didn't make a bloody fool of myself by going there. <laughs> I just cross-checked. I said, let us check. And it's saying 60, say 63A, 1B. And I'm saying, there's no section like that. Then I checked and all of that was bunkum. This thing, since those laws had not been fed into the GPT, it started imagining sections. And it gave me imagined sections and everything. I have those notes. If anybody wants, I can give it to you <laughs> to prove that this is a For Don't use it like a search engine. It's not a search engine. Yes, but that's good. So somebody was talking about, uh, I had gone to an industry conference, and they said that, what about chatbots? We can use chatbots. So I gave them three examples. Uh, a church in the US, it's, it had an AI pastor recently. By the third day, it started telling people to have baptism in Gatorade. <laughs> this is serious. You know? <laughs> and uh, there was one by Air Canada, which invented a refund policy and started giving money to people. And the court said, your chatbot has said it. And they had to return that money. The chatbot created a policy. And for Chevrolet, this, this, this boy started giving Chevys in one dollar. <laughs> so anybody for business use case, it's right now an immature technology. Don't, don't uh, start putting chatbots because they are just smart autocompletes. And they, they have no mind, they have no brain of their own. Anybody thinking that this is going to be the next Terminator, time may be. <laughs> Up to 10th, it will get out of it. See, recovery becomes... Uh, okay, so begin with... I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give you a quick tip on, on recovery. So as soon as you lose money, you should first of all dial this number 1930. Okay? Please just note this number. Anybody losing money, as soon as you dial 1930, what they do is that they talk to... Uh, all the concerned institutions, like a message goes to Paytm, this wallet, that wallet, buy now, pay later, dunya bharka, jo bhi aajkal ban rakha hai, uh, you know, various kinds of apps, and ask them to stop payment on this. So the flight of money goes. Otherwise, what we see is that, let's say 50,000 rupees have been duped from you, it, you know, breaks into nine parts, and these nine parts travel, I don't know where. It's like opening a jar of flies, they fly off. And then all this gets aggregated somewhere, and then somewhere, Bengal border pay, somebody withdraws from an ATM. That also account is a bogus account. Now you understand recovery is difficult. Because you have to deal with so many intermediaries, and a lot of this information sometimes um, is not within India. It's outside. Very difficult to get information about um, anything. See, Google, Facebook, they know that we all are sitting here. But if you want to ask them something, they start teaching us law. So this all Natak Baji started from uh, something called Section 230C of the Communications Decency Act. Now the Communica Communications Decency Act of California, it says that anything done on the platform is not their responsibility because it's a safe harbor. Same provision was continued in Section 79 of the IT Act in India. And these provisions are safe harbor provisions that anything happening on platform is not theirs. But you know, the cybercrime economy has grown to be a $10 trillion business. It's three times India's GDP. It's the third highest GDP in the world. Now, never has been crime so successful in the world that people, due to, due to this technology, you know, they can reach your pockets. Earlier, it was so difficult to reach into your bank accounts or pockets or this thing. I tell this to banks. 
that you cannot say that the customer is stupid. You gave me this app. I didn't ask you to give this app. It's your business to secure this app. You can't say you are stupid, you gave this OTP or whatever. Don't give me an OTP. Give me some other method. If you are taking my money, it's your responsibility. So the RBI, recognizing this, has limited your liability to 25,000. Provided there is no contributory negligence. If you have willfully shared your, willfully, shared your OTP, then it's difficult. But otherwise, if somebody has just hacked into your this thing, you have done nothing, that somebody has made, let's say, um, $10,000 transaction on your card uh, in Bali, none of your business. They have to refund you. They have to refund you. There's a Reserve Bank of India circular which limits your liability to 25,000 rupees. That's it. So you have to call up 1930. Second is that whenever you get time to go to your police station, it's a different thing. Um, okay, under the new code, the, the new criminal laws, um, under the BNSS, now you can lodge an email with FIR. Okay? However, I see the lawyer blinking. <laughs> However, uh, within three days, you have to go and sign it. So you will be able to lodge an FIR. Yeah, please. Yeah, so you, you can file an FIR on through electronic mode. I think probably including WhatsApp also, if the local law enforcement gives you this number. But within three days, you have to certify and go and sign it, uh, probably physically. So um, on the flight of money, you can prevent the flight of money by calling up 1930. Then there's this site called cybercrime.gov.in where you can go and register your complaint. Uh, it can also be anonymous. That if, let's say you don't want to share your information, you feel that something has happened, or that this is a proof, you can put it there. Without, you can do it anonymously. Uh, recoveries are less because there is this whole thing called money mules, where there are people who are doing this account loaning. So there are poor people who give their current accounts for loan, and somebody says, oh, this is a work at home scheme. We'll give you 10%. Money will just flow through your account. But those poor people don't know that all the cybercrime money is automatically going into that account, and he just gets 10% or whatever, if at all he gets. His account is being used, and he's also being duped. So when you go and find out, you don't get anybody, because he doesn't know. His card is with somebody else. India lost a great chance in linking of Aadhaar with everything. You know, uh, there was a whole which was against Aadhaar. Okay, let me tell you something surprising which you will not believe, is that Aadhaar has never been breached. Yeah, Aadhaar has never been breached. And if you seriously come, I can take you to Aadhaar office and show you. See, Aadhaar is a digital identity which is biometric. And nowadays they are giving you virtual Aadhaar also. We as Indians, we need something physical. We a card. It was never, there is no card. It is a biometric digital identity. There is no card. We made, an, made a card out of that. Usko chhaap ke, usne apni gandhi si photo laga ke. <laughs> now, wo to chodo. Then others have also started to accept it as proof of address, this, that. It's never meant to do that. It is supposed to be a biometric identity. Yeah, that to now it has been, it has a virtual identity. Now, what has leaked in each case is basically copies of this stupid Aadhaar card, which some smart Alec has put in some beneficiary scheme, that thing is insecure, and somebody has hacked it, and the whole database comes down, and they say Aadhaar has been leaked. Aadhaar has not been leaked. Aadhaar, digital biometric identity, sits in a secure vault, and it does not interact with the internet. It interacts with something called a middleware. And it only talks to the middleware. Right? There is no access to the internet. It is sitting inside a vault. And it does a, and I, I don't know whether that will make you happy or sad, but even police does not have access to Aadhaar. So uh, if let's say a murder happens here and there are fingerprints, I can't go and check on the Aadhaar database because I cannot perform a one to n search. I cannot perform a one-to-n search on Aadhaar database. And police has no access by law to Aadhaar. Yeah? So it can only be used to authenticate whether this is registering or not. It will say yes or no. That's it. Aadhaar does not contain any other data. It does not contain any other data. 
your aadhar when it is says linked you may be linking it to bank account or something to take benefit where aadhar is not storing that information the bank account is storing your aadhar information and it is using it to cross verify your identity and let me tell you that once aadhars were linked to uh, phone numbers at the time uh, the init initial reliance G uh, geo thing i never found any cyber crime happening on those numbers because your real identity was linked to that number but a lot of privacy lobby is this that they you know made so much noise that supreme court dropped it and it's unfortunate because if you just solve this one thing called kyc now your customer if you solve this one thing cyber crime would be down by 90% point is that these days everything has become more of a convenience right i mean say simple thing like banking today or simple yes, thing yes. like upi which yes. is probably started by yes, us and yes, is the best yes. thing yes. now you you said something basic thing is like how do you safeguard yourself is by using basic common sense but if i have to log into my phone if i want to make use of it i don't have a choice but to give them certain details sure now that's one factor of it the second is an incognition mode i'll come to it but the first factor so if i'm giving these details how is it that i can protect myself because that's like for example my where am i going today i'm here i may be in juhu i may be in bandra how do i stop myself from google or the cia to use this information because this is not in my hand as much common sense as i may have for it right that's one second is how safe is incognitio mode because you have this setting called privacy incognitio you may be doing some research third is that the government authorities have access to all of this right so there must be some way like if the government authorities is using internet to do perform their activities that they are doing how are you guys securing yourself and how can that be implemented in a normal layman's life so that we can secure ourselves because there are many times that like there are senior citizens there are kids maybe kids are more smarter smarter but the senior citizens they have nothing to do so things like this how do you save even the voice clone there must be some way to protect yourself or the biometrics these days senior citizens find is easier to have a biometric to safeguard the phone because remembering the number might be a difficult situation so how do you stop that from leaking there has to be some way in the security which can come up to us and which can be used maybe to tighten it at least maybe little tighten because this is it's going to be an ever increasing technology so there has to be some end to it how is the government protecting themselves which question to do i answer first all of them are connected <laughs> actually all of them are connected which is why i was just giving an example yeah. the point is how do you safeguard yourself i mean we all know the terror we all know the threat what next it's i'm sorry but i had to give so many examples so when i say because I, one moment i really don't know when was i going to get a chance again so i said let me just make the most of it and ask it you, to you. you 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 are a lawyer you have the floor <laughs> oh there are many more over here i'm sure they all have but still yeah No, that's it. That's it. <laughs> that's it. Thank you. For now, you. <laughs> For now that's you. it. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, incognito mode. I'll start with that. It's uh, slightly safer because it uh, protects you against something called profiling. So the way I said, device info dot me. Each of these services have profiled you, and they maintain a deep profile of you. That uh, here is a person who uses this particular Galaxy phone. this number with a chrome browser not the this browser the browser is of this particular you know version not updated um, so on and so forth so there's a bunch of information which they use for something called behavioral tracking now behavioral tracking can be prevented by using a vpn if you use a vpn especially a paid vpn if you use then yeah then lot of uh, apple i think also is giving a built in vpn now so lot of this would be so the behavioral tracking and the economy around that because there's a lot a lot of economy around behavioral tracking um, that would start slowly coming down so corporate surveillance is a big issue because the corporates if they want they can change the fate of the countries they can decide how you think what you would do where you would vote where you would not they can decide yeah and look at cyber criminals cyber criminals can actually uh, bring down economies of the countries um, the bangladesh bank heist an old case 2016 or something poor country 1 billion dollar 1 billion dollars were you know attempted to be uh, stolen finally it it got detected due to a spelling mistake 
Now, thanks to chat GPT, spelling mistakes are not going to happen. <laughs> Cyber criminals are going to write good English. Earlier, otherwise, they used to give you Coca-Cola lottery <laughs> or the Nigerian prince. But uh, at least those guys are, have, have become smarter now, and they'll use chat GPT to uh, write better socially relevant uh, emails to you to, to dupe you. Um, yes, there is a huge enablement on the other side. On the cybercrime side, there's a huge enablement. So if you're using VPN, then the criminal is using anti-forensics. They're using anti-forensic techniques that even when we catch them, you don't get anything. Because let's say if he is using virtualization and if he is using a virtual machine, by the time you enter, his virtual machine is gone and there's no forensics left on that. Nothing, zilch. You, you know, image the device, do anything, nothing is left. Plus he's using proxies, he's using VPNs, he's using Tor and it's very difficult to locate him and find him. Uh, the owner of the Silk Route market, one guy called Ulbrich, FBI took kind of eight to 10 years to track him. He just used one email twice and they got him. But that's the ray of hope. That there is so much of evidence left there that someday uh, the analytical capabilities of law enforcement, of intelligence, uh, of police are increasing. That we can also now take a large amount of data. And uh, for example, with you know, ATM thefts and people pickpocketing at ATMs, what we do is we overlay the CCTV with tower dump details. So tower dump details, are, but these guys have become smart. These guys then you know, put their phones off. So then we also look for negative of this thing, that okay, which phone on this area it stopped functioning, and for how much time did, did it not function. So there are algorithms which can be run. It's a cat and mouse. It's happening on both sides. Incognito is good for tracking, for somebody who's you know profiling you. Um, and on common sense, if you are you know uh, like Chinese loan app scam, if you indulge in dangerous behavior, see same with life. That if you are, you can meet an accident. You can be pickpocketed. You can be mugged. But the chances of you getting mugged, if you go into that alley, jahan logon ne mana kiya hua hai, and people say that this is a dangerous place. Don't go to dangerous places, on internet as well as in life. And about this whole structure of how government and everybody protects your privacy, <clears throat> the new DPDP, you know, Data Protection Act, uh, Personal Data Protection Act, which India has come up with, it's a good act. Because it puts great emphasis on limitation of collecting data. You have to have a purpose of collecting data. So even in the government, if, if I'm taking data from you, I need to have your consent. Without consent, I can't take your data. I have to declare the purpose, and I have to also destroy that data after the purpose is over. I can't perpetually maintain that data. Then I have to limit the collection of data. Then the responsibility of protection of that data, its encryption and security, is also on the data fiduciary. So new laws have come up. Technology is evolving. Um, however, technology is a very fast moving cloud front. And there would always be more enablement and more cooperation. I always say this in, in police conferences, that the bad guys cooperate, good guys can't. So bad guys cooperate so well that, let's say, if I can put a bid on the dark net for hacking, right? I can say, I want this particular bank account to be hacked or this Facebook profile to be doxed. And there would be people who'd be ready to do it for $40 an hour. And they collaborate and they can sell you tools. But if I want an information from, let's say, Poland, or UK, I, I'll keep writing letters and emails. It's very difficult to get through the legal system to get information. Or if I uh, talk to Facebook or Google, they start showing us American laws. That is why in 2021, India came up with uh, digital media intermediary uh, you know, guidelines and ethics code, wherein they said that there's a three-tier structure today. And everybody's going to face this at some time, that there would be content about you. Whether you, when you want to take down and you have a reason, uh, let's say some private photos of you have been put up somewhere, you can actually write to the nodal officer and it is his bounden duty to remove that within three days. So just check for these guidelines and nodal officers are available for this. And there's a three-tier structure in which government doesn't have to do anything. It's a self-regulatory body. That first layer is their nodal officer, the grievance officer, India grievance officer. And for everybody, for WhatsApp, for Telegram, for this thing, any uh, you know, platform having more than 50 lakh customers in India has to have a resident grievance redressal officer.
Above that, then there's one more level, and the other final level is where they would check whether there's been compliance or not. So, legal changes are happening, technological changes are happening. While this is happening, two, three things. One, basic cyber hygiene. You have to maintain, uh, update your devices. Uh, when, when the operating system says, you know, there's an upgrade available, go for it. Because if you actually go and study, you would have found that they would have patched hundreds of things. And, and that's essential. So at least you won't be in those million people who are vulnerable, their phone can be hacked. Or something new comes up, so they release a new patch for that. So basic common sense, you know, upgrading your phone. If you are also, if you are doing something which is sensitive, so it's like that, that uh, if you really have diamonds, you would store them separately. Similarly, if you're doing something high value, then be careful about that. Don't use a stray Wi-Fi. Uh, don't use any, you know, uh, apps which have non been, not been downloaded from a proper store. Uh, yeah, because there are many apps, many copycats avail uh, apps available today. Hundreds of apps which are copycat. But because at one point they say no music on the phone. No, no, nobody's saying, the no, no, the, the, the phone is much more secure. Phone is much more secure than your uh, desktop because it's with you and you generally control what comes on your phone. Um, so a phone app is also, a phone app is actually just a browser. But the phone app is much more secure and controlled because it has been specifically secured. Yeah, so that uh, the information which it is sending is encrypted. If I run a man in the middle attack, I won't be able to. If I run a Wi-Fi capture, I won't be able to get your password. So use the app, but download the app only from your trusted you know, sources. Because there are copycat ads. Somebody asked. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I've got uh, two, three questions again. How so, much time do I have? Yeah. So quick, quickly, so I've done my cyber crime investigation course in 2014, so 10 years ago. Wonderful. Where basically we were taught how to decode the messages which went behind images and videos. Steganography. Right. Yeah. Uh, so how prevalent is that? Because I'm not in touch as much right now, but how prevalent is that? And should people be just blindly forwarding things? Because that also you're dealing with terrorists sending messages to each other, et cetera, and communicating. That's one. Steganography is an old thing. I mean, uh, okay. in actual cases, I've rarely found it to be used. Okay. You don't need to. There is, there's so much of encryption available that you can't break it. Okay. You, you know, uh, you, you, you use a good PKI, and I don't think so computers can break it today. Unless until quantum computing comes, difficult to break encryption. Right. Uh, second is, uh, I have a retail store for gadgets. Uh, so I get nearly two to three customers every week coming in uh, saying that my Insta account got hacked. Yeah. Uh, and I've seen that they're just beyond a point, don't uh, cooperate and yeah. Yeah. this thing. Yeah. So what is the Indian government doing to kind of try and enforce something onto them? Because this is becoming very, That's very what, common. So Indian government in 2021 came up with these new laws. So you have to basically <coughs> talk to the nodal. And the nodal officer's number and this thing is available on the net, you can find out. And they have to. It's, it's a legal duty upon them. If they don't do, they lose their safe harbor status and they become party to that crime. So they have to do it. But besides that, you, the government cannot enforce anything on them? No, <coughs> difficult. Uh, the government can make laws, right? Yeah. Okay. But for recovery of millions of Instagram account, then I, we won't have any other job but to do only this. <laughs> so one last uh, small question is, again, Apple uh, has not transferred their... Uh, what you call servers out here in India, and that's why... Nobody has transferred any servers here. Okay. No. So what I had gathered that some of the other people have done, and they've yeah, been able no. to no. work on so some data stuff. localization Therefore, requirement... Apple Pay is not working in India because of that. No, date, uh, th that's a different thing. Data localization requirement by RBI. RBI has said that if you have financial data on my country, on my uh, this thing, <coughs> you keep a copy of that data here. Nothing wrong in that, right? Right, yeah. So uh, Apple Pay doesn't want to comply to that. They won't get a license. But otherwise, if I want to have financial data of my people here in my country, my citizen, it should be kept here. Okay. Because tomorrow some fraud happens, then I keep writing to the government of Ireland and they say, no, no privacy, you know. Right? Even for terrorist cases, they say privacy. So also, if you look at the scheme of the Constitution, there is no right which is like supreme and above each other. The rights are in a particular framework where they balance each other. So like privacy or right to assemble or no such right overrides. So privacy doesn't override right to life. In a criminal investigation, there's no concept of privacy. 
See, about privacy, it is said that uh, my house is my castle. It's a common law saying, my house is my castle, and even the king of England cannot enter. Yeah, but the day you commit crime, everybody has a right to breach that door and pick you up by the collar and take. There's no privacy there. Yeah. Last yeah. question? Yeah. So, uh, I wanted to ask, what is the state of uh, cyber warfare in the world, and what is the threat it poses to countries? Is it more than, like, like terrorism, or is it both put together that pose a greater threat or oh, one yes. put together? It's, 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 it's really bad. So read about these things called uh, APTs, Advanced Persistent Threats. China has uh, two units, uh, second bureau, third department. Uh, one unit is 612, and 61246. There are two units. They're the best people in the world. They can do anything. They can loot banks, they can bring down power grids, they can uh, stop devices, they can do anything. So in, in, in the uh, Ukraine war, uh, the Russians used an infrastructure, you know, hack, which is called dark energy, and they actually brought down power grids, right? Similarly, Saudi Aramco has been attacked twice and oil production was stopped due to an Iranian hack called Shamoon. Shamoon 1 and Shamoon 2. So this is now going to those levels. In India, 2017, I think, the JNPT port, Terminal 3, it got uh, affected by uh, not Petria and 18% of India's shipping traffic was affected for three months. Look at the colossal loss. Ships coming there, containers, things which were to be put from here, everything stopped. This is the state of cyber warfare. You know, National Health System of UK, it totally collapsed because of one ransomware, not Petya. So this is colossal, this is colossal. And there are countries which like nuclear capability are holding these capabilities. And um, in, in event of warfare or otherwise, I think they can have large scale kinetic effects. So this is more on an indirect level where it impacts the economy, it's not like a what you would consider like a terrorist attack or like those kind of things. And like, like I think you mentioned, but are countries like India developing an army on the front of like cyber security? Like, Ab sab bata denge to. Wo bhi to sun rahe na. We we have good good capabilities. We are number three in the world, right? Pardi de. Okay, for all you people who believe that WhatsApp, uh, WhatsApp mat phone karo or ispe phone karo, these all apps are encrypted. Nothing is going to happen. Nobody has any access to it. Any, uh, no government is able to listen to any of your communications. Um, <laughs> and the government is not so much interested also. Yeah. <laughs> As if alto log self interested rehte hai. My phone is under tap. Are, bhai, you are not so important. Yeah. <laughs> to thoda tax nahi bar hoga. Baaki kuch nahi hai. <laughs> Um, and now GST ho gaya hai, digital. Ho gaya hai. Um, so apps are safe that way. Uh, moreover, the, I shouldn't be saying this, but the Apple platform is very safe. It's very safe because Apple spends huge amount of money on, on uh, cyber security. For example, if I make an app and if I want to put it on the uh, Apple store, the security testing, uh, testing takes months and the Apple doesn't uh, you know, approve it very simply. So they're very good. Also their data sharing policies are very strange that they don't share data with governments. Even in case of terrorism, they are recalcitrant. Now this, this appears good to us till we are not affected. But imagine this, tomorrow somebody wipes off all your income and, and sells all your houses and then Apple says, sorry, privacy. <laughs> right? Yeah. So it's, it's good to talk from the uh, uh, other end, but when you seriously deal with crime, it's different. Um, all the apps are encrypted. Your communication, your metadata is available. So I would come to know ki raat ko ab do baje kisse baat kar rahe <laughs> If not, if you are not using a VPN, so that can be known. That's not difficult. Metadata is available. That a call going to whom, the call record kind of thing is available for every app. That is available. That can be known, and that data is used later on when investigation happens. I can then definitely ask, what are you talking about at 2 o'clock? Tell me, what is it? What is your job? You're talking about 2 o'clock at 4 o'clock. What is it? And 
uh, let's say if something important has happened. Like in the parliament case, parliament case, you had constant phone calls with the terrorists when people were entering there. Why are you in touch with these terrorists? You have to answer that. And then finally, if I get a device, whether you have deleted anything, there is nothing ever deleted on a computer. It just hides it and says it's deleted. There is nothing ever deleted on a computer. Aap mujhe format karke device de do, mein aapko nikal deta hoon. Give me a formatted device. Wo pehle tha. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can be done. If you want. But there are data recovery techniques. Which, which, which can do, you know, chip, chip off and JTAG and things like that, which can take data from very fragmentary things. So there is development on both sides, uh, good and bad. See, it's, it's a war of uh, the dark forces and good forces, and it's always going to happen. The world is going to function this way. Uh, it's only thing is that for us not to be caught in that, we have to have basic tenets of cyber hygiene and of understanding that this technology is like fire. It can cook food and it can burn homes. What do you want to do is up to you. That's so it. well said. Thank you. We are so enthralled, actually speaking. Lawyers, and he did speak a lot about crime and safety out there. Second, is there any possibility for you to come to my school to address <laughs> students? If not you, if you could assign someone. So I think it was very effective. I'm sure you will all agree. Educationists like me, we are walking on eggshells. Every morning when I come to my office, there is something or the other related to Instagram, WhatsApp, dating apps. We are walking on eggshells. And even me today, at times I'm lost. So your session was very enlightening for me and for all of us. Thank you for spending your evening with us, for sharing so much of knowledge with us. And on behalf of the entire Rotary uh, Club of Bombay Bayview, we would like to thank you. A large hand of applause for sir. And um, I would also like to thank Rotarian Sanjay Luka for connecting us to sir. Thank you.